Listen just for a moment to this tragic testimony. As a child, I doubted I was worth keeping. My insecurity even kept me from riding the carousel at an amusement park because I doubted my dad would wait for me. I thought he might leave me forever once I was out of sight. Doubt has also robbed me of the joy of water skiing as a young girl. I refused to try it because I wasn't sure my family would come back to get me once I let go of the rope. I questioned whether I was good enough in college, so I avoided some great opportunities because they brought the risk of rejection. Even as a young bride, I doubted my husband's faithfulness. Our newlywed memories include a lot of arguments about trust. The good news is, this is the story of a wounded heart. Today, Renee Swope has a confident heart. As Executive Director of Communications and Radio Ministries for Proverbs 31 Ministries, she's able to bring encouragement to women every day along with um, one of our favorite people, Lisa Turkhurst. <laughs> it's just delightful Thank to you. meet you. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. And that is the start of a good story, mm -hmm. Renee. Mm. It's heartbreaking at the beginning. Uh, but you have a beautiful family today. I want to show a picture right great. as we begin. Look at this lovely family. And uh, not not to Lisa's influence, you, you adopted before she started a whole bandwagon. Well, actually it was after, but it oh, was, was it? there she's, uh, Aster is actually from Ethiopia. Um, but it was years <sighs> after uh, Lisa's adoption and, and God brought that whole community to adopt. I believe it's over 40 children from Liberia. Isn't that something? And, um, but yeah, this is something that my, the Lord had on my husband's heart for years and um, just a big part of our um, journey that God's bringing us through. And we brought home Aster right as the Lord brought a, opened this door for me to write the book. Mm -hmm. So, um, but she was such an amazing gift and uh, joy in the midst of uh, such a new adventure. So. Wonderful journey. Congratulations. Thank you. Your first book. Thank you. Yes. Not your first writing. Yes, no, but my <laughs> You're first book. In so many places. And you've dedicated the book to your family. I have. It warms my heart that you are enjoying what God intended family mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. That's not where your story starts. Mm -hmm. No, and I believe because I didn't have that happily ever after dream that every little girl wants, and so many of us don't have. I mean, so many of us come from broken homes and disappointments, and um, but because I didn't have that, I longed for it so much, and my family is such an important part of my life and my number one priority and where I'd rather be uh, than anywhere in the world. But God's brought that brokenness and used it to do something beautiful and brought redemption even in those hard places in my testimony. It wasn't the story I wanted. I remember when I came to the Lord, I wanted God to give me a new story that I could tell, a Christian good girl story with a white picket fence and all my dreams come true. And, and yet God wanted to use the brokenness and the things that I wish were different to bring, give me hope and then to equip me to be able to give hope away. One in five families in America are single families mm -hmm. today. That's just one aspect of that brokenness. Mm -hmm. At the end of every chapter, you have question, discussion, mm -hmm. great for a group experience. Yes. And one of the first questions you ask, not unlike many counselors, where is the earliest childhood mm -hmm. memory of mm -hmm. confidence erosion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was yours? It was those things you read earlier. You know, just I think it's important to go back and to really find where did that pattern of thinking start that led to our pattern of doubting ourselves. And so mine was, as a child, being afraid to get on that carousel because I was just sure that once I was to the back, my daddy would walk away and the, the water skiing. And just there was, it's interesting because growing up, I came across as confident on the outside because my, my mom raised me to be independent and confident and not have to depend on anyone. And, and yet, on the inside, there was that fragile heart that wondered if I was worth staying for, if I was worth keeping. And it took me, I didn't realize that was a pattern of thinking until I was in my 30s. And I just saw this, um, just this theme, this thread through my life. And, and I, I just began to ask the Lord, help me to figure out where that came from. And I really believe for me that it possibly came from the fact that my parents divorced when I was two. I don't have any memories of my father being at home. And I think by him leaving as a little girl, you know, it's all about you when you're a kid, especially mm -hmm. you think, oh, if I had only been prettier, if I'd only been smarter, if I'd only been something, he would have stayed. And so I felt like I wasn't worth staying for. And I think I just tucked that seed in my heart and let it 
fester and become a cancer that eroded my confidence in every area of my life. Now, an important truth here is that salvation didn't fix this. Right. Uh, for, for a long time, uh, you, you had some religious experience. Mm -hmm. it took you a long time to figure out yes. it's about a relationship. A relationship with Christ. That's and I think right. it's January 89? Yes. January of 1989. I had gone to church off and on all throughout my life, but I had a lot of religion. I, I grew up thinking it was what I needed to do to please God. And yet, no matter what I did, I would eventually feel that emptiness again. And so I was very performance based and putting my hope and my value and my confidence and what I could accomplish and what I could acquire. But even when I got those things, eventually that would erode. And I was hopeless because I had so much of what I wanted and yet it wasn't enough. And that's when I actually began to struggle with depression and anxiety and hit a really hard place. I call it my rock bottom where I cried out to God because I wanted to die. Dude, and you were I, looking at a telephone pole I was, as your way out. That's right. I was like, if I could just wrap my car around this telephone pole, it would end the darkness. People would think it was an accident, and I could just end my hopelessness. And, and that night, I pulled off to the side of the road and just with tears streaming down my face, just said, God, I can't do this anymore because I didn't want to hurt my family. I didn't want to bring more devastation to our story. And then in the weeks that followed, I found myself back in church again, um, not to do more, but to find more more and, and giving God a chance to fill that empty place. And eventually it's like I'd heard the message over and over, but it didn't sink in until I was at the end of all of my self efforts. And then it's like my heart began to open up that it was God's love. This is such for. an important thing. You say until God's love is enough, mm -hmm. nothing else will be. That's right. The tragedy, Renee, as you illustrate, and I want to read a little piece here, uh, you, you illustrate so clearly is that because we got that emptiness mm -hmm. and, and lack of fulfillment, mm -hmm. a, a, a popular choice to, to try mm -hmm. is, is just fill, fill the calendar. Right. Uh, listen to this. I always had to be doing something. And, and I just think, and I'm not the counselor here, but I think the fear <laughs> yeah. of abandonment, that the brokenness so early puts you on a path of people pleasing, mm -hmm. of trying to mm -hmm. earn. Maybe mm -hmm. if I do this, yes. then. I'll, I'll measure up and I'll get the approval. That's right. I was a teenager when this is when it started. I was a yearbook editor, captain of the basketball and football cheerleading squads, a member of the Beta Club and FCA, and I helped with the school newspaper, participated in extracurricular activities, and worked part time. I'm exhausted just from typing all that. <laughs> You couldn't say no. I couldn't say no. I didn't want to because I got my value from all that I could do. If I can just prove I'm worth pursuing, I'm worth knowing, I'm worth delighting in. But it was all based on what I could do. But even when we do and we succeed, it's never enough because we can't keep up with it. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. So we either take the, the path of doing, 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 and we burn out, or we just shut down and don't even try. Because I think there's two paths people go when they want to be valued. They just don't try and they shut down or they do to do until they reach a place of burnout. It is a pain avoidance mechanism it is. as well. It was my it? numbing mechanism, mm -hmm. definitely. I tried everything and business was busyness was one of my go-to drugs. <laughs> you know, we just learned uh, from a guest the Chinese characters for busyness, mm -hmm. heart plus killing. Wow. Those wow. characters together wow. make mm -hmm. the word, mm -hmm. the concept, busyness. Wow. And sometimes you almost have to hit the wall, mm -hmm. burn out, mm -hmm. before you realize this is not doing it right. for me. Right. Well, and I think as Christians, we the Bible talks about being created to do good works. And we want to make an impact. We were created to make an impact and to live with a purpose. But when we put our hope in those things and we find our identity and our confidence in those things, then we are in such a a vulnerable place where it will be eroded because we're only as good as our last accomplishment or we only as valuable as the, uh, somebody's last uh, opinion or compliment. Well, the next day we might have made them mad and then all of a sudden they're criticizing us. Mm -hmm. So we were doing great that day we got that promotion or we got a pat on the back, but then the next day when we get criticism, we're crushed yeah. because our value is being found in our performance. Mm -hmm. and, and people's response. And people's response that. and people's approval and people's words of encouragement. God created us for a need for approval, for a need for acceptance and affirmation. But he created us with that desire so it would lead us to him Absolutely. to find 
our fullness in it. You know, that's and then everybody else is just an add-on or a takeaway, exactly. but it doesn't define us. But you can live for the applause of one. Right. And anything else is, da is very dangerous. And I've lived there. I mean, I lived there for over 30 years, even after I became a Christian when I was 22. It took me 10 more years to realize I had taken all of that people pleasing and that performance based living into my relationship with God. And I thought still that I had to do more to please Him more. Was there a tipping point where you woke up as a Christian mm -hmm. woman and said, I've got a deeper issue here that yes. I got to uproot. Yes. I remember exactly where I was because um, I was sitting in my living room. I had children. I had a husband. I was in ministry. And I was like, Jesus, I know that you promised that life would be abundant, but there's nothing abundant in my life. It's a busyness and obligation and duty and stress. And I want what you have for me. And I could feel um, when you've struggled with depression, it's like when a storm moves in, you can kind of smell the storm. I could sense the storm clouds of depression moving back in. Take you down. And I was, it scared me. And I, because I knew if I let it come too long, it could take me down. And so I cried out and just said, I want that abundant life you promised. And the Lord prompted my heart to go back and read my old journals from when I first became a Christian. And as I read those old journals, I saw this young girl who was head over heels in love with Jesus. And then she got busy again. And I just felt like I was saying, return to me, return to your first love. And I start praying that God would give me a love for him and a desire for him that I had in the first days of our story together. And I stopped, you know, I mean, I was a busy mom. I would, my house had to be perfect. I mean, I, I, my, I found my value in everything. I mean, before I could have a quiet time, I had to have all the toys picked up and the kids, you know, put away and they're doing their naps and just everything had to be just so. And the Lord was like, I want you to just spend time with me and let me clean your heart instead of you cleaning your house, you know, <laughs> find your identity in me. And it still took, I will tell you, it took 10 more years for me to get to a place of having a confident heart. It's a process. It's a journey. Change came over time, but it wasn't an overnight thing. Was there a place where you realized, I'm not striving anymore? Where you nestle instead of wrestle? Well, I will say something had to happen. With um, where A turning point came. One day I was getting ready for a speaking event, and I share this in the book, and I was struggling with doubt and uncertainty, and I was like, well, I have been a Christian for almost 20 years. Why am I still wrestling with this? I mean, God, you've called me to speak. Shouldn't I be like equipped with confidence? And I was begging him to zap me with confidence, and I was in my bathroom getting ready, putting on my mascara, and I turned around to put something in my suitcase, and I noticed this huge nine-foot shadow on the wall. And it took my breath away because I'm 5'2", and I thought, wow, that shadow is so much bigger than I am. And the Holy Spirit whispered to my heart, the only reason you can see the shadow is because you've turned away from the light. And mm -hmm. I just sensed the Lord saying, turn back towards the light. And it was the light in my bathroom. But as I turned back towards the light, I realized I was no longer standing in the shadow. And God used that to show me that's the shadow of doubt. When you turn away from the light of my truth and you focus on yourself, then that shadow of doubt comes and it becomes bigger than what you doubt, which is yourself. You make such a big deal of yourself. So that day, God used that to equip me to start moving through a life-changing process that was more permanent. Maybe there's someone watching who thought as you did that confidence is something you're born with mm -hmm. or you're not, mm -hmm. and that's just where you live. Mm -hmm. You now believe it is the birthright of every child of God. Absolutely. I believe that we have the power and the security available to us that Christ taught about, that we, our identity in Christ is what gives us, I call it Godfidence. We don't need mm -hmm. self-confidence. I mean, when we focus on ourselves, I think that's when we block the truth of God's light in our life. We need Godfidence. And as a child of God, it is our birthright. Sure, some of us are born and we grow up in a circumstances that give us confidence, but that's self-confidence. But every one of us as a child of God has access to His power and His promises to give us um, lasting God confidence. The one who says, I will never leave That's you right. or forsake That's you. Right. Woman's That's number right. one fear, abandonment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure where this touches you today, but um, the promise of the proverb, the Lord will be your confidence. Mm -hmm. There are times I claim that. Mm -hmm. Me Lord, too. I be feel like confidence. I'm walking a gangplank, yes. but you said you'd be my right, confidence. Right. And he never fails. Right. 
you but we might, have to walk through it. it that's exactly we what have, I was going to say. That's why I, I wanted the subtitle to be to live in the security, not just to know the security, mm -hmm. to live in the security of God's promises. And this literally is the how to stop doubting yourself and live in the security of God's promises. Mm -hmm. Renee Swope, wow, I hope this isn't your only book. But it's a gem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much Thank for taking you. that journey with the King, doing the heart work, and now sharing it with people all I over the world. I hope many will join me. I hope many will join me.